From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. On the second half of the show, a portion of my colleague Steph Machado's new program on WPRI.com, The Pulse of Providence, with her guest, Providence Mayor Jorge Alorza. But first, a federal lawsuit against the state of Rhode Island over mail ballots. John Marion, Executive Director of Common Cause Rhode Island, explains. John Marion, Executive Director from Common Cause Rhode Island, thanks very much for joining us. And I want to start with a lawsuit that Common Cause Rhode Island is a plaintiff in. It's against the state and specifically the Secretary of State and members of the Board of Elections in their capacity as election officials. And we'll get to that in a minute. But John, if you can just walk people through what the lawsuit is all about. Sure, absolutely. And uh, thank you for having me. Uh, and our Fellow plaintiffs are the League of Women Voters of Rhode Island and, and three uh, named individuals. Uh, and the lawsuit is uh, suing state election administrators, uh, asking them to waive the requirement in state law that mail ballots be signed by two witnesses or a notary public. Uh, so right now, uh, if you want to vote a mail ballot uh, on the envelope that the ballot goes in, you're required to put your name, your signature, your address, but you're also supposed to, in the presence of two witnesses or a notary public, vote your ballot. Have, once you put your ballot in the envelope, have them sign it, um, and then you seal it up and, and send it off. Uh, that requirement of the two notary or the two witnesses or a notary, we're suing to try to get that overturned just during the pandemic. The reason is there are social distancing rules in place, and we don't want voters to have to leave their house and go find uh, two other people if they live alone, or one other person if they, if they uh, live with somebody, uh, or a notary public who, there aren't a lot of notary publics around, and, and have them sign that because they're gonna have to break the social distance, um, distancing recommendations, particularly folks who are elderly, um, who've been ravaged by the pandemic, and people who are immunocompromised. Uh, so in our, our complaint, we talk about, or my declaration, uh, we talk about two of our members, one of whom is 80 years old, uh, lives with her husband who is 85, has prostate cancer. She does not leave her house. She has her groceries delivered. Um, she has been a voter uh, since the 1960s, and she does not uh, want to have to do this. She wants to be able to vote safely, and so that's why we're trying to get this overturned. So, John, the uh, state Republican Party has opposed um, removing these uh, requirements, uh, with, as you point out, two witnesses or a notary public. Um, they have fraud concerns, which I want to ask you about in a moment, but I'll just read from you another point that they make. They say that, look, we're in, in phase three of reopening. And to quote them, it says, uh, they say, if it is safe enough for 50 people to meet indoors, for nursing homes to accept visitors, then it is safe enough for a voter to have his or her mail ballot envelope signed by two witnesses or a notary. What do you say to that? Yeah, so, so a couple of points. One is the primary isn't until September 8th and the general election isn't until November 3rd. And nobody can predict the course of this pandemic, right? So, you know, many states thought they had it licked and they started opening up. Uh, and now we're starting to see maybe a, a surge in those states, particularly in the South and the West. We don't know what's gonna happen in the next three months uh, in Rhode Island. So we're saying, let's be prepared for the worst. And the worst is we have a second wave when kids go back to school and you know people go back into their offices or go back into their homes because it gets cold in, in October. And we have a terrible second wave. You can't decide on November 2nd how to run an election on November 3rd. You have to make those decisions now. So that's, that's the one um, uh, rebuttal I would have to that. The second is the vast majority of states don't require this, right? There's only less than a dozen states that require even one witness or notary public. During the pandemic, several states have repealed that or it's been repealed by, um, because of a lawsuit. We're down to there are two states that require two, no, two witnesses or a notary, Com or Rhode Island and Alabama. And when you use the terms voting rights and Alabama in the same sentence, it's usually not a pretty picture. It has been used actually as a tool of suppressing the vote in some states, 
And it was going to suppress the vote in Rhode Island during the pandemic to ask people to go find witnesses or notary. Well, before we get to the, you know, concerns that there might be in Rhode Island, and, uh, you know, there was a bill that passed the House but failed in the Senate. I want to ask you about that. Let's address the fraud concerns uh, raised by the state Republican Party. Look, John, we're in a state that has a voter ID requirement driven in large part years ago because of concerns um, about voter fraud. Uh, you know, and there are people that are concerned that if you lift these requirements where someone uh, doesn't have to have their uh, mail ballot authenticated in the way that it's authenticated now, that that might just open up uh, the state to a lot of voter fraud. Is, are those concerns misplaced? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So, and I would say two things. One is, you know, the vast majority of states that don't have these requirements don't see widespread voter fraud. Um, you know, there are states, Oregon, um, for example, that are 100% mail ballot, and there are not prosecutions for voter fraud in those states. Uh, the, the second point is actually this requirement might provide an opportunity for fraud that in its absence wouldn't exist. There are known campaign operatives in Rhode Island who get paid to be mail ballot campaign experts. And they are oftentimes notary publics and they will take particularly elderly voters a ballot um, and they will offer to notarize it and they may try to coerce that person to vote for the candidate they're working for. This would eliminate that opportunity. You know, if this were waived, the voter could request the ballot, receive it by mail, vote it, sign it, steal it, send it back by mail, and no other human being would have to be anywhere near that ballot. Unless this is waived, those campaign operatives are going to be able to swoop in and say, hey, you know, I'll witness and notarize your ballot. In fact, why don't you, don't lick the envelope and I'll, I'll drop it off at the Board of Elections for you. We don't want to have that happening. As I said, the, um, the, the, there was a bill in the House that passed, it failed in the Senate that would have lifted these requirements, but it also had some other things in there that would have allowed for uh, mail ballot applications to go out. Uh, I assume Common Cause Rhode Island supported the House bill. However, do you think that was a mistake in hindsight, John? It, should a bill have been more narrowly tailored that might have survived the House that just dealt with the issues that you're now filing suit over in federal court? No, because, you know, honestly, even if we're successful here uh, in this lawsuit, you know, there's a, a bigger problem um, that that bill addressed uh, and unfortunately didn't pass. I shouldn't say a bigger problem. There's a, a, another problem, which is that for June 2nd's primary, not only did the governor waive the requirement of the, of the notary or the two witnesses, but she encouraged through her executive order that an application for a mail ballot be sent to every registered voter in the state. And what we saw was, you know, turnout that was quadruple uh, or quintuple what you would have predicted for that presidential primary. We actually encouraged people to vote by mail and they responded and they voted by mail. And that's not being done for the September 8th primary. And that would have been required by the bill that failed uh, in the Senate, but passed the House. And we really believe deeply that, that that's a failure of leadership in the state because many states, uh, including neighboring Massachusetts, are doing that. Massachusetts, whose primary is just one day after ours uh, on September 9th, uh, last week, mail ballot applications arrived in the mail for all registered uh, voters in the state of Massachusetts. Could, could mail ballot applications have been sent out without uh, interaction by the General Assembly, without that bill having, uh, you know, passing? Yeah, we believe they could be. Um, there, I think, is a dispute um, where the Secretary of State thinks she has the power to do that, uh, although she chose not to for September 8th. But the General Assembly uh, leadership, based on, a, on your reporting or Channel 12's reporting, uh, does not think she needs express authorization from the Assembly. Our reading is that she could do it. It's simply an application. It's not a ballot. Um, and so we think she could do it. She's not going to do it for September 8th. We continue to press her um, to do it for November 3rd. You know, a lot of people know that lawsuits can drag on, particularly when courts are, are really trickling through cases right now mm -hmm. because of the pandemic. 
Do you have any concerns that, you know, with the primary just, what are we, six weeks away uh, from the primary at this point, that this thing will get, your lawsuit will get bogged down in federal court uh, before it, it needs to be addressed? Yeah, I mean, so there is, a, a, as I've, I've been advised by our attorney at the ACLU that um, there's going to be a meeting of the attorneys tomorrow morning, um, Friday morning. Uh, and so, you know, hopefully it's resolved very quickly because that, that printing issue that's involved. Um, so it's got to be done uh, within the next several days in order to be successful for September. But we'll continue to press for November, right? There's two elections coming up. Uh, and we know participation in November is predicted to be uh, record participation across the country. So we need to be pr prepared for that as well. Yeah, rumor has it there is a presidential election in November. All right, John Marion, Executive Director for Common Cause Rhode Island. Thanks for much, uh, so much for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me, Tim. When we come back, my colleague Steph Machado's interview with Providence Mayor Jorge Alorza. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers, I'm Tim White. This week, WPRI.com launched an exciting new project, The Pulse of Providence, a program hosted by my colleague, Steph Machado. For her first episode, appropriately enough, Steph interviewed the CEO of the capital city, Mayor Jorge Alorza. Here now is a portion of that interview. Last week, you made an announcement about um, studying, doing potential reparations for the African-American and indigenous communities here in Providence. Uh, how, how realistic is that? There was a little bit of skepticism saying the city is having all these financial problems. We're talking about potentially taking out a line of credit. How do you afford uh, payments to these communities in the current financial picture? Yeah, so, you know, a lot of, a lot of folks have had questions of, uh, what shape will reparations take? Um, what will be the scale? How long will they last? Who will be eligible? And let me say that all of those are legitimate questions to have about reparations, uh, but they're questions for another day. Uh, what we announced last week was a commitment to a process. And the process uh, is gonna go in three, in three phases. The first phase is gonna be a truth telling process. Now we have to uncover um, our history, uh, our, uh, our history with slavery, our history with discrimination. And uh, that's gonna take a little bit of time. Some of that work has already been done by other organizations. So we'll build off of the work that they've done. Uh, but we have to gather that, that data and compile it, put it all in one place where it's easily accessible. That will inform the next phase, which will be the reconciliation phase. And the reconciliation phase, that's the opportunity to bring folks together. Uh, as I've talked to leaders in the uh, black community, you know, I've been struck by, first of all, how deep the injuries run but also how, but also by the fact that history isn't just a thing of the past. History is something that informs and shapes the present in very real ways. And through this reconciliation process, we can bring people together to have those conversations and see in the very real ways that the discrimination of the past is actually discrimination of the future as well and is still impacting folks. I think that this has a, a, um, uh, this has a, a great potential to uh, help bring the community through a community healing process and uh, help us unite uh, help us come help us emerge as a much more united community and so once those two phases are are through then it sets us up well we understand that there's been an injury well what do we do about it and at some point in the future there'll be a committee that gets established and that committee will be uh, will be responsible uh, for making recommendations for what, for what reparations should be. And I'm very open to uh, what those recommendations are, um, but it's important that we allow uh, black voices to lead the conversation. And once they set up those recommendations, then it's upon us to, to determine, okay, how do we make these a reality? There are a lot of cities that are experimenting with UBI, with universal basic income. So, if that's something that the, that the committee says that we should look at, then we should look at it. If the community, if the, if the committee says, well, we need more community investments in, in these areas, well, then those are investments that we need to figure out a way to make. Um, there's a, there are also other recommendations such as, you know, the, the, the city can continue to make the investments that it makes, but it should make them in a more race conscious way. And so that's another thing that we can take into account. 
And so the, to, to answer your question, those are all legitimate questions that we should ask, but they're questions for another day. And whatever the, uh, the recommendations are, then it's upon us to make sure they become a reality. You say they're questions for another day, you know, your term limited. So is this gonna end up um, being the problem of the next mayor when, they, when the next mayor tries to figure out his or her budget? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't phrase it as a problem. I would, I would call it an opportunity. And I mean, uh, the my, you know, I mean, the, I mean, for the yeah. financial to figure out where do you, if you're going to do UBI or going to do payments, where is this going to come from in the budget? I would say, I would say yes and no. So, you know, I don't, I don't expect this process to, um, uh, to, to take two and a half years to complete. It's something that I want to see done, uh, done right and done well but also done with urgency. And I want to receive these recommendations so that we can start acting upon them right away. At the same time, I do think that there's, a, there, there, there's, a, uh, there's the opportunity for this to turn into a long-term plan that the city commits to. And, and that's a good thing. Um, there's no way that we're going to uh, make up for 400 years of discrimination in just one year or one set of investments. These are long-term investments that, that need to be made. And that's why it's so important for us as a city to put this marker on the ground that we're committed to this process. More than we're committed to you know, one particular outcome, we're committed to going through this process and then handling uh, whatever decisions and investments need to be made as they, as they come due through this process. And the process can certainly extend um, as long as it's needed, uh, as long as it's needed to make things right. Would you be willing to borrow money, you know, at taxpayer expense to pay for the reparations, whatever form they may take? Um, I mean, it's, it's interesting. We, you know, we have to start off being driven by let's do the right thing. Um, so two points come to mind. Um, you mentioned borrow money. We borrow money all of the time and we borrow money for infrastructure, for in infrastructure investments. Um, with those investments that we make, uh, perhaps the recommendations from the committee will be to invest these dollars in underrepresented, uh, underinvested neighborhoods. That's certainly something that, that we should that we should consider if that's what the recommendations come up with. Now, I'll also say that uh, I'm, I'm cognizant that there is no way that City of Providence, frankly, any city in the United States, uh, can uh, can make the black community whole for the injustices that they have suffered. Um, and so, you know, while uh, we're taking the lead on this at the, at the municipal level, uh, we also need folks at the state level, folks at the federal level, and folks at the institutional level, both private and nonprofit, to step up and be part of the solution as well. So that's, that's part of us jumping into this process. It's that uh, we also want to inspire others to, to lean into it as well. It can't just be us, but uh, uh, nonetheless, we'll do our part and uh, we'll push as much as we can because what's right is right. And uh, you know, this is, the, this is the right time to do it and it's the right thing to do. So it sounds like the answer is yes, this could potentially end up borrowing money depending on what it is. I mean, again, it, all legitimate questions, but um, they're, they're, they're questions to be answered um, at another day. And I think that the more that we're successful at getting people to engage in this process with us, um, whether you're inclined for it or inclined against it, I ask people to participate, be part of this process. And I truly do believe that we all, every human being, we have a moral instinct somewhere inside of us that when we are presented, we're, when we're faced with patent injustice, that we want to do something about it. And, uh, and the injustice is clear. Now the question is putting it front and center. Uh, what are we going to do about it? And these are questions for all of us in the community to decide, um, you know, how committed are we to this? And uh, will we right the wrongs of the past? And, uh, you know, my, my opinion on that is that our community will be strongly behind it, that uh, we'll see this as the right thing to do, and we'll want to do, we'll want to do the right thing. Got it. Um, Mayor, one more sort of financial um, issue that you're dealing with, and again, the future mayors are going to have to deal with is the pension fund. We had a Supreme Court decision a few weeks ago um, in favor of some retired firefighters who had some 
high, you know, compounding colas. Um, I, I mean, I know, I, I know that you're, the actuaries are trying to figure out the financial um, impact of that Supreme Court decision, but it sounds like this is going to have uh, short-term and long-term impacts on the pension fund. You tried in the past to monetize the water system to help with the pension liability. No one wanted to do that. Uh, what can you do in the remaining years you have in your term? Yeah, so yeah, you mentioned the, you know, what we tried to do with the water supply board, and there was no appetite for that. And uh, the options that we had were very limited. And uh, unfortunately, with the Supreme Court opinion, it makes those options even more limited. You know, there, there are definitely things that can be done. You know, there's, you know, asking things such as asking um, uh, employees to contribute more to their pension fund. All those things can be considered, but they have to go through uh, collective bargaining. Um, so, so we should explore those kinds of things. Uh, but the reality is that the ability to do a once and for all um, uh, pension reform solution that solves this is going to be so much more difficult for not just my administration, but future administrations to do. Effectively, what the Supreme Court said is that you only get one crack at the apple. And uh, um, uh, Providence had that opportunity back in two, uh, 2011, 2012, and it's going to be incredibly difficult to do anything uh, once again on pension reform. So it was disappointing that they ruled that they ruled that way, uh, but um, but it is what it is. It's a Supreme Court opinion. Um, we're going to be fine for the next couple of years, but my big concern is that the pension liability continues to increase each, each year. And uh, uh, as our payments continue to increase, it squeezes out other investments in the budget. And so over the next couple of years, I would hate to see the city uh, continue to cut, 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 um, and going deeper into the bone and uh, um, slowly and, and slowly eroding the vibrancy that we're seeing right now. Um, so that's my main concern. We likely are not going to see this all come to a head anytime, I'd say, in the next maybe five, six, seven years. Um, but certainly in the out years, maybe a decade from now, um, whoever's mayor at that time is going to have to confront this. And the tools that that person will have at their disposal are going to be so much more limited and than they were before the Supreme Court opinion. So are you going to try and go now to either the current employees unions or the retirees to negotiate uh, changes? Is that something you can do while you're still mayor? Those are conversations that we that we have started, uh, but you know, the, remember that 90% of the li unfunded liability is for current retirees. So we're talking about, and it's actually less than that, I believe. So you take all current and future employees, and the, the liability associated, unfunded liability associated with them is only somewhere between 8 to 10%. So let's say even under best case scenario, you get uh, um, dramatic concessions from current and future employees to reduce uh, uh, to reduce the city's portion of the, that pension liability. We're talking reducing it what from eight to maybe six percent. That'd be a 25 percent improvement on the city's part, but in the grand scheme of things, it would only be reducing the whole unfunded liability from 100 percent to 98 percent only a 2% difference. So, um, you know, there, there are things that the city should consider, um, but uh, make no mistake about it, there are minimal, minimal um, interventions compared to the scale of the unfunded liability. Um, Mayor, before I let you go, and uh, thank you for taking all the time to talk with me, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask about politics. As we mentioned, your term is, is up, um, your term limited. How serious are you about a run for governor in 2022? Honestly, Steph, we'll see, we'll see what the future holds. Uh, I will say that I am blessed in that I have the best job in the world. I think being mayor of Providence is the best political job in the state. Um, I would also say it's probably the most difficult political job in the state. And, uh, you know, as, as, I, as I look at, you know, potentially running statewide, um, that decision will have to be made at some point in the future, um, but I know that whether that opportunity is available and that door is open depends entirely on how good a job I've done at running the city. 
So I'm going to continue to focus on that, running the city as best we can, making it one of America's great mid-sized cities. And, uh, and by carrying on that focus, if there's a window of opportunity at some point in the future to run statewide, then I'll explore it. Um, but as of right now, my focus is 100% on the best job that I've ever had, which is being mayor of Providence. Steph covered a lot of ground with the mayor, including the start of school and the future of the Providence Police Department in the era of the defund the police movement. You can watch the entire interview right now on WPRI.com. And congratulations to Steph on the launch of the Pulse of Providence. I want to thank you for watching, and we will see you next week on Newsmakers.